Number Knitting, the new all-way stretch method by Virginia Woods Bellamy. Introduction. What is number knitting? The first time I was invited to speak on the subject of number knitting at the Brick Store Museum of Kennebunk, Maine, I was introduced to my audience by the charming young assistant director. After a few complimentary remarks, she soared dizzily. And now I am sure that Mrs. Bellamy will tell us all about the history of knitting. And sat down. I rose to my feet and took a long chance. Does anyone here know anything about the history of knitting? I asked hopefully. Not a hand went up. Heads moved, as in school, from right to left. From that moment, I loved my audience. Neither do I, I confessed, which gives me more time to talk about the history of number knitting. To myself, I added, and luckily for me, since I just made it all up, no one can contradict me. However, since my pupils are already out designing and out knitting me, my small advantage will not last very long, while the disadvantages of presenting a new method, a subject, a new anything, in fact, are endless. For a number knitting, it has been necessary to find a new way to display it, to tell about it, to teach it. Even the book has a new look to knitters because it is illustrated by graphs as well as by photographs. Anyone who does not know what graph paper is will before the end of this book. At about this point in one of my lectures, a forceful looking New Englander raised her hand and asked, but would you mind telling us what is number knitting? Now, nobody knows what a new invention is until it has been seen, and that is why there are so many photographs in this book. That is also why I have learned to carry samples of number knitting with me in large plastic pillowcases, because even photographs do not convey the beauty and the lightness, often gossamer quality, of a number knitted fabric. For number knitting is a method of design which uses very little yarn, and since yarn is bought by weight, this is an advantage. You can dress more children in less yarn or give fewer children more dresses for the same price that usually produces one expensive hand knit outfit. The basis for this economy is the really new feature of number knitting, which makes a fabric knitted by units, squares, triangles, rectangles, picked up one from another that will stretch in any direction and yet pull back by itself into shape. Hence, the units of number knitting produce a circular stretch and a crossway stretch, or what may be called an all-way stretch fabric. The units are usually made of a much looser stitch than is used in regular knitting, require less time to knit, and use less yarn. Yet, they achieve a stability previously produced only by tight knitting. The disadvantages of knitting tightly are obvious. Wool is a beautiful and alive medium, a knitter's hands feels the wool on the counter, instinctively testing its elasticity and lightness by touch. She may not know it, but she is looking for that live quality in her yarn. Now, this same live yarn under a microscope reveals the delicate and exquisite mechanism of a strand of yarn. It resembles the hinges of the spinal column. To knit too tightly can only result in strain, like the nervous tension in the spine, but on the yarn, Pulled to the limit of its elasticity, it can relax only in shrinkage, which is certainly the nervous breakdown of any fabric. Shrunk into a board is a reflection, not only on inefficiency in washing knitted fabric, but an unconscious protest against the careful knitter who has been taught to knit evenly and tightly or the work will never hold its shape. When in my teens, I first learned to knit it was because I wanted to make a scarf for a beloved cousin. And is knitting not a craft patiently learned by most knitters for reasons rooted in the affections? By the time I finished the scarf, the dear old lady who had taught me to cast on a knit plane had died. My cousin had forgotten that she ever wanted a scarf, and the word knitting was enough to set me on fire with rebellion. Later, when I thought I was grown up enough to come to terms with tedium, I learned to make socks as I lay out of doors on the porch of a TB sanatorium. These, I was told, good socks and bad alike, must all be disinfected by a steaming and shrinking process before they could be shipped on their charitable journeys. <laughs>
Still later, when I wanted the pleasure, and I thought, economy of dressing my baby in a woolly jacket, I decided to learn about the wool industry and dutifully bought a number of booklets and a quantity of wool from yarn shop. What do you want to make? I was asked. I didn't want to be pinned down, and anyway, how could I tell until I had looked over the booklets? A jacket, I said at random. How much yarn do I need for a child's jacket? How old is the child? Allowing for the haphazards of time, I added a year and said two. Cardigan or slipover? I don't know. Well, you'd better make up your mind. It takes a lot more wool for a cardigan than for a slipover. My eye, roving wildly, had just caught sight of something on the cover of a booklet. Maybe I'll make him a blanket. Pretty big for a blanket, but of course you know what you want. Yes, that was the trouble. How much yarn would a blanket take, I asked. For a child as big as that, and of course he's going to keep on growing, you'll want around 24 hanks at least. 16 for the smallest baby afghan. To be safe and not run out, and of course we can't guarantee matching dye lots, you'd better take 30. You could always return it. The yarn for a child's afghan turned out to be $1.20 a hank. I made a rapid calculation, subtracted desperately from my husband's salary, and said weakly, would the same yarn make a pullover? She gave me a look that was the essence of patience and contempt. Silently, she took out a ball of another kind of wool. 75 cents. Oh, that's much cheaper, isn't it? One ounce. This tank is two ounces. I left the shop at last with twice as much wool as anyone could possibly need for a size two sweater, comforting myself with the thought that I would have a lot of money coming to me the day that I returned the unused yarn. This time, I really put my mind on it. I made a sweater labeled in the picture, size two. But hating to stretch the yarn as I worked and admiring the lovely looseness of my stitch, I gradually forgot the gauge and decided when the pullover was finished that my boy was going to be a giant and I would just save the jacket for him to wear a few years later. Then I gathered up with elation all the balls of yarn I had not used. I carried them back to the shop. Another expert stood behind the counter. When did you get this? She asked suspiciously. I don't exactly know. Surely it couldn't have been six months ago. Where's the slip? Are you sure you bought it here? She took the slip of paper and looked at it wearily. Then she gathered up the yarn and handed it back to me. We never take yarn back after it's been out as long as this, she said tellingly. Besides, we don't carry this yarn anymore. You should know better than to keep it out so long. Now I was a rebel against knitting. I took my leftovers home and looked at them resentfully. I'd like to knit my own way, I thought. I picked up a ball of the wool and squeezed it gently in my hand. It not only looked beautiful, it felt beautiful. Only why did they make it so thick? Why couldn't it be gossamer fine and knitted on large needles to look like a spider's web? But I knew why. It would never hold its shape. It would become a string. It would look like nothing after it had been washed. Well then, I'd make it up in two layers. I'd take this leftover yarn and make the kind of jacket I liked myself. At least it wouldn't shrink into a board and there would be no printed words to scold me from the pages of directions. I was lost in that minute without knowing it. I had fallen in love with wool and the germ of invention was stirring. I would never again be free of the hand pushed to creation by the imagination. I made up the little jacket in no time at all compared with the drudgery of following detailed knitting directions in which I lost my place on every row. I thought of two things only, the baby's body and the yarn, fitting the beauty of one to the beauty of the other, and the result was a surprisingly practical garment. By the time that there were two babies, I had a depression on my hands, along with a lot of other people who had babies. And in working out a way of dressing my two children from the skin out in knitted clothes after my own easy designs, I was saving not only on the cost of the clothes they wore, but on laundry bills as well. These clothes, light and porous, could be washed in the hand basin and dried overnight on the towel rack. The summer's sunsuit became the winter's underwear, and a size 2 chemise would become a size 6 shirt. At this point in my progressive knitting, my friend Marjorie Wells MP sent me to the Women's Home Companion, 
where I had the pleasure and profit of selling the idea to Martha Cobb Peabody, and later of receiving letters from women all over the country telling me of their enthusiasm for the idea. No one knew that in making these designs for my own and other people's children, I was actually learning how to knit. The layette for the baby was made of the plane or garter stitch. An outfit for the little girl of two used the stocking and smocking stitch. The four-year-old boy, who was growing fast and needed a stretchable outfit, wore shirts and shorts of cotton made up in rip stitch. Because he had an allergy to wool, his underwear had to be made of cotton, top suits of the same material, and only cardigans and snowsuits of wool, but all giving the greatest amount of elasticity. By the time mothers had learned to make these wardrobes, I argued, they would know, and I would know, the principal stitches used in knitting. With friendlier feelings, I now delved again into the knitting booklets in search of new stitches. I had become fascinated by the various combinations of knit and purl. I tried them out in designs that might mean news to the women's magazine world, for Mrs. Peabody had said that if I had wished to sell an idea to magazines, it must be news since they had the whole world of yarn manufacturers to draw upon. Slowly, I began to sense the reasons that lay behind my dissatisfaction and early rebellion against knitting. The old harangue on the differences between the arts and crafts is familiar to everyone. An art makes music, painting, sculpture, poetry. A craft, on the other hand, makes something useful. The more useful, the more successful. An art is sufficient to itself. A craft must serve something besides itself. But it is a strange fact that the more truthfully an object has been made to serve a human need, the more time seems to endow it with the quality of art. Old tapestry was made to keep away cold drafts and to enchant the eye so that cold might be forgotten, and it became an art. Yet modern tapestry is not so beautiful as the old, perhaps because its usefulness has been reduced to mere decoration. Pettipoint, quilting, laces, the hooked rug, all have survived times, serving the needs of use and beauty. But what about knitting? No craft was ever more useful. Taking a lesson from my first lectures, I have tried to discover something of the history of knitting, and I have learned that in the long past, it became a real art. Charles I went to his execution wearing a blue brocaded knitted shirt of silk to be found today in the London Museum, St. James, London. Other museums show us examples of Egyptian knitting, samplers from Europe, early knitted laces, and rare old ecclesiastical gloves. Knitting as a craft outruns history and indeed had become an art in the early days of Egypt. Mary Thomas, whose books on knitting are to my mind the most fascinating that are being written today, tells us that the Egyptians learned knitting from the Arabians and that in the Queen of Sheba's city, Shabwa, knitting was held to be so old an art that the pattern on the serpent's back was claimed by legend to have been originally knitted by Eve. It seems evident that so long as knitting used the knitter's original design, it took its place unconsciously in the realm of art. One has only to look at a few of these photographs of ancient knitting to realize how much we have lost through the invention of knitting machines, which are used not to promote a craft with its partnership of imagination and hand, but to produce saleable garments in profitable numbers. The inventor of the knitting machine is interested first in the speed of the knitting machine. The manufacturer is interested in the saleability of the garment and the designer is interested in the usefulness of the design. The yarn manufacturer is naturally interested in the sale of yarn, yet the manufacturer of knitting yarns is the only one who serves what is left of the craft of knitting. It is he who manufactures the medium used by the craftsman, the knitter, and stamps the design with, chicken feather yarns are the best yarns. Use chicken feather yarns when you are knitting chicken feather designs. Now this is fine as far as it goes. The trouble is it goes in a circle. For unless an artisan moves a craft into the realm of art, it will chase its own tail and wind up on the wheel of a machine. I ask myself, why have other forms of needlework lived longer as art than knitting? Why has the artist neglected it? Are there limitations in knitting design not found in other forms of needlework?
Design to the uninitiated begins in kindergarten. Colored blocks cut into squares, triangles, parallelograms may be fitted together into pictures. These are little more than shapes of color suggesting streaks of lightning, mountains, rockets, stars, and sunbursts. They may go further and stiffly outline flower petals, leaves, or a butterfly. But each design begins with the same square and triangle. I wish, said Vera Bartlett, you would design a layout for me on squares. All I can knit is a square. What, I wondered, in terms of kindergarten design, would be a knitted square. I had to dismiss the thought. There could be no such thing. Every knitter's square would be different from every other knitter's square, since a knitted fabric would stretch more or less according to the looseness of the stitch, but it would always stretch further up and down than from side to side. In knitting, a measured square could have no relation to a mathematical square. You can measure a knitted square by inches, but to knit a mathematical square, you would have to have the same number of stitches high as wide. Your cast on row would be the width, your ridges would give the height, and 12 ridges would measure higher than 12 stitches could measure wide. Now design, since it begins with kindergarten blocks all cut to the same scale, must rest upon a mathematical principle. But blocks hold their shape while knitting stretches. The Scandinavians have solved the problem by carrying contrasting yarn behind the row and picking it up when needed for a design. How beautiful, I thought, if knitting design could be accomplished without all that extra weight, if there could be units all upon the same scale like a mosaic or a stained glass window and one picked up from another. Florence Hamilton had shown me that knitted blankets could be edged with chained stitches by slipping the first stitch and purling the last stitch on every row. This chain not only looked better as an edge, but those stitches might be counted easily and picked up and knitted directly, as with a crochet hook. I wondered what a new square would look like knitted from the chained edge stitches of another square. It will probably pucker and look like a mess, I thought, but I had to know. 12 stitches times 12 ridges, cast off, turn sideways, and pick up the 12 edge stitches. Another 12 ridges knitted on those 12 stitches, I directed myself. I continued going around the original square with other squares until I had completed nine squares. To my astonishment, the knitting did not pucker. Stitch complied with stitch and rearranged itself, shifting gently to suit the contrary pull. I had in my hands a piece of knitting that stretched evenly in all four directions. Excited by the establishment of a mathematical square, I went further. If I could decrease at the edge of each ridge by just one stitch, would I not come to one stitch at the end of 12 ridges and have a triangle? I tried it. I had a triangle, but naturally it stretched further one way than another. But suppose I made two triangles at once. I could cast on double the number of stitches, decrease twice in the center, one for each triangle, and what would happen? What happened was something I had seen crocheted into pot holders, a square with a diagonal line crossing from one corner into another. I broke the yarn and looked at it. It was two triangles, but it was a square, a real square of knitting, measuring the same in inches and counting the same in stitches on each of the four sides. No moment of my life is more clearly remembered than that quiet one in the sunlight above a beautiful harbor. I was suddenly thrilled beyond bearing by a square of knitting crossed by a diagonal line. Someday, I thought, someone will invent a whole new method of knitting design on a common denominator principle. It will move in every direction, make any kind of square, as light as air or as strong as carpet. I wish I could live to see it. I may not have lived to see it, but the temptation to follow the idea through trial and error, experiment and failure has never left me alone. Emerson says that man can find happiness only in the triumph of principle. The small part of mathematical principle, which illuminated for me the humble, useful, ancient craft of knitting has given me hours of happiness in those moments, especially when through stumbling experiment, I have seen the principle triumph. On one such occasion, my daughter exclaimed to me, isn't it wonderful mother when something goes wrong, the fault is always with you, never with number knitting. Another friend, 
Mary Demarac, and the progression of number knitting seems to add up into a saga of friendship, first introduced me to the use of graph paper when I was recovering from an attack of pneumonia. I had an almost miraculous cure when I discovered that here lay the key to my lowest common denominator. One box of graph paper could be the key for knitting any designer picture. I had always wanted to draw and had never been able to. The lines wobbled, the balance toppled, nothing I drew on drawing paper ever looked better than hopeless. But who might not be able to draw simply by following the straight lines of graph paper? My first attempt to draw a blanket design resulted in the patchwork baby carriage robe of plate A. My second attempt was the road and wall design that let me knit three colors in continual succession without once breaking the yarn until the end of the blanket. In the third drawing of a blanket, I decided to make the simplest design possible in two colors. So I built a square upon square and rectangle upon rectangle into the blanket called Stare and Sky. It began to dawn on me by this time that I had found something I had not been looking for, a fabric which might be built in the knitter's hand to stretch in any and all directions. I had been looking for a method of interior design in knitting that would not demand the carrying of extra yarn behind the work. But here was something even more exciting, a piece of knitting that might actually be as delicate as a cobweb and yet would not stretch out of shape. As I floated the finished product from my hands, it appeared to stretch and recover in all directions so that the design without sag or pucker seemed a clear painting on the air. By then I knew that I must draw my first picture. Here it lies, lambs and butterflies, on a child's bed looking as though it had been drawn by a child experimenting with crayons. But I knitted it up recklessly, finishing inside of three weeks. Since then, it has hung on walls, over chair backs, and for three months from the rafters of the Lanier Exhibition Barn at Lanier in Elliott, Maine. Yet loosely and quickly knitted though it was, it has always recovered its original shape after these exhibition and lies in the photograph as it was first made, having never been blocked. Other pictures followed. Presently, I had a book full of number knitted designs, but since it was impossible to knit as many designs as I could draw, I began to realize that unless other knitters joined me in my experiment, the discovery could not go very far. The word principle is a frightening word implying something that we cannot possibly understand, yet gardens are made every spring by people who would find it hard to outline the principles they are dealing with. Here I was, unable to draw and ignorant of higher mathematics. How could I explain that because of a mathematical principle, a blanket could be knitted more easily than a garden may be planted? More soberly, I tried to formulate what I had learned. The road and wall design had been sold to McCall's Needlework magazine, which later published three more articles on number knitting. Miss Elizabeth Blondell, editor and builder of the magazine, which has become the Needleworker's Bible, offered me a vital piece of advice. This blanket presented a new idea in knitting, she insisted, and the method should be patented. Just as I had learned to knit by working out the idea for a child's wardrobe, I now learned to formulate my new discovery in the offices of my patent lawyers. The lawyer who prepared the claims for patent was the first to point out to me that all the units of number knitting resolved themselves into only two, a square and a triangle. But it was Mr. George Bean, the partner who first listened to my story, who opened a new window for me, giving me an even clearer view of my own aim. I had apologized for taking up his time in asking him to listen to my newfangled notion about knitting. I suppose, I concluded, that patent lawyers suffer a great deal of boredom listening to other people's ideas of possible inventions. Boredom, he exclaimed. Patent lawyers have the most exciting business in the world. They see tomorrow marching through their offices. Humbly and respectfully as a knitter, I formulated my method based on a simple square and triangle and submitted my claims upon tomorrow. Three years later, after a move from New York to Maine, the seal of a patent was handed to me by Mr. Maynard Douglas, mail carrier of Elliot, who shook a blizzard off his shoulders as he delivered envelope from Washington.
Meanwhile, Mrs. Henry Obrey, the teacher of English at the Elliott High School where my daughter was studying, asked her new pupil if she were related to a knitted wardrobe booklet by which Mrs. Obrey had dressed her children. So it happened that Mrs. Obrey brought Elizabeth Williamson, director of the Kennebunk Brick Store Museum, to see the new knitting. Exhibitions were arranged, and soon women of Maine and New Hampshire organized classes and came to Lanier House to learn about number knitting. Craft Horizons asked for an article, and other articles followed. By Ethel Eaton in the Christian Science Monitor, by Dorothy Tooker in the New England Homesteader, and Louise Jerica in the Hand Weaver and Craftsman. And the Pathfinder rang up from Washington to ask for an interview by telephone. As a result of this unexpected publicity, I found myself deluged with mail and in a quandary. Only through the kindness of my friend and neighbor, Mrs. Bernice Clark, was I able to answer requests for information by offering a correspondence course, which finally required more time than either Mrs. Clark, acting as corresponding secretary, or I had to keep in touch with subscribers living as far away as Alaska, Australia, England, and South Africa. For these subscribers, whose requests suddenly appeared in my country mailbox from distant countries, and who certainly comprise one world of knitters, I shall always have a special feeling of gratitude and appreciation. They have become my family of number knitters, irritated, no doubt, by delays and irregularities of service, since I found myself floundering in a tiny publishing business before I knew it, but always indicating an eagerness for the next lesson, which at times took on a note of threat. They may eventually have learned to number knit to their satisfaction, but all six lessons, finally accomplished, taught me far more than my subscribers, and it cost me far more as well. Before the final lesson could be completed, I was asked to tell about number knitting in a book. So here at last is the book begun in a friend's house on the Atlantic Ocean, continued in my home at Lanier, overlooking the Piscataqua River in Elliott, and now finished in a house above Blue Hill Falls. The book has gathered itself together, always within sight and sound of moving water, in my grandfather's state of Maine. When I am asked how the idea of number knitting came to me, I can only answer that it seems to have moved like water from the casual suggestions and kindly impulses of friends into its own channel. I merely followed it as I have moved up the coast of Maine, trying to keep up with it. I should like to thank Mary Louise Morosoff for the photographs of Young Wilder Wheelwright and Mr. Frederick L. Young for the photographs of picking up and joining stitches. Names endeared to me forever are those of the models photographed throughout these pages. They have stood or reclined patiently through heat, cold, and at least one tempest ending all electricity under the arc lights and facing or behind and sometimes beneath the camera in order to bring the appearance of a new fabric to a distant eye. I can hope for no kinder tribute than these voluntary models have given to the work of my hands. My final thanks go to Mr. Douglas Armston, whose exceptional photography becomes the real storyteller, and to those who modeled the designs for his pictures. Mrs. Douglas Armston and her daughter Beverly, Dr. Hilda Libby Ives, Dr. E. Petrie Hoyle, Mrs. John Marlowe, Mr. Beverly Hazel, Mr. Jonathan Sawyer Jr., Christopher Alvord, Baby Alvord, Margaret Lanier, and Jane Churchill Bellamy. My thanks to, to Edward Ozern for the seven photographs of models appearing on pages 60, 96, 117, 199, 241, and 247. For references made in this book to those ancient examples of knitting to be found in museums of England, I am indebted to Mr. George F. Timpson, M.A., M.L.A., of Maiden Hill House, Stone House, Gloucestershire, who sent me his rare books and photographs of treasured specimens of knitting belonging to the history of his country.